Hello, and welcome to another Input Ace webinar. This week, we'll be talking about integrating video directly into 3D point clouds. I'm seeing a lot of new members that have not attended a webinar series from our, our company previously. So just to get started here, my name is Andrew Fredericks. I'm the technical director for Input Ace. And I'm going to begin here with a very quick overview of what Input Ace is, where it sits within the workflow, and then we'll be spending the majority of today's webinar going through a brand new feature that is soon to be released in the software uh, related to integrating video into point clouds. Input Ace is a workflow engine for handling video evidence. Video evidence today comes in a number of proprietary digital video formats. So for example, when collecting video from a scene of an incident, the formats come as a .dat, .dav, .vam, .ssf, or any hundreds of other proprietary video formats. They cannot be played with traditional players by double clicking on them and opening them. And many companies produce their own proprietary player to play back the data. However, as we've covered in past webinars, oftentimes those proprietary players can misread critical information by dropping frames, by stretching objects, by changing color values, and can affect the image in ways that would ultimately alter our ability of properly calculating distance and time on those uh, images. What Input Ace provides is a very simple interface to take those video files, drag and drop them into an intuitive interface, play the data, convert the data, tag relevant images and clips of video from the data, and then extract that data into court-ready standardized file formats. Most of this process has been covered on previous webinars, so I'd like to move forward quite quickly through this so that we can talk about the primary reason that we're all here today. On Input Ace's interrogate tab, which is the default location that the program launches into, Users can play back the data and can tag relevant images. For example, by striking the M key, I can mark an image, calling this one, in this case here, my suspect in a typical major crimes incident. And then we can continue to move forward by tagging chronological exhibits. When ready, we can toggle over to our workflow tab, where we can process the data in a number of different ways, including enhancement techniques, building demonstrative exhibits, or simply converting the data into a standard format like MP4 in this case. So here what I've created is an MP4 output where I'm deciding to ensure that when anything that is processed by this output maintains the original evidence, frame by frame by frame, all we are doing here is putting this inside of an MP4 output while maintaining all of the original pixel values of the file. So after a couple of quick button pushes, we can now connect any one or all of the files all at once to that output. And then we can execute this workflow to process the data all at once. So in just those two seconds there, every single file now has been converted into my output directory. And from here, we can now double click on the file and open it up in a standard player like Windows Media Player. That's the basics of what Input Ace provides, a simple to use tool to convert, process, and manage video data. I recommend that if this is your first time experiencing the power of what Input Ace provides, that you take a look at some of the other recorded webinars that we've run in the past. For today, we're going to take a look at a term called reverse projection. Reverse projection is a type of photogrammetry, in other words, a type of uh, uh, methodology to calculate positions, measurements, and distances within a video image. In this case, we're going to be utilizing 3D point clouds to perform that process. Reverse projection is a technique that involves taking video evidence, overlaying it on top of a 3D point cloud, and then dissolving back and forth between the image on top and the 3D data on the background to then project through the image and measure positions. Reverse projection involves three primary steps. The first step is to calibrate the images. Most of the surveillance video images that are being collected today include lens distortion that is in non-linear format. And I'll talk about what that means on a later slide. 
that data needs to be calibrated relative to the accurate 3D background. Then the data is overlaid on top of the 3D background, and then ultimately we can measure through the image. I'm going to show a very quick example here of what this looks like on a simple case. Here what we have is an original video file from a CCTV camera system. And what you'll notice is that the background data, like along the sidewalk here, is a curved area. In reality, this sidewalk is a straight line, but the lens distorts the image and causes the curvature that you see here. What's unique about surveillance systems is that the lens distortion is typically non-linear. In other words, we're not dealing with a direct linear translation uh, and, and linear curvature inside of the image. The reason for that has a number of causes. Things like the dome of the lens is not going to be manufactured in a perfectly spherical way. Oftentimes there are smudges on the, on the lens that will change the relationship of where an object appears and a number of other factors that cause some challenges when trying to correct this data. The first step, which we'll show again how to do this on a later slide, is to correct that lens distortion, to create straight lines from objects that were, current, were previously curved. Once we've corrected that, the next step that we like to perform is to crop out the edges, simply to provide a rectangular image that is easier to look at. The outer edges of the uh, image are going to have a higher amount of error and if they are not relevant to the case at hand, it provides a much easier view to crop that data out and rely upon the area that is of interest. Once that's been done, we can bring in our three-dimensional point cloud behind the image. And now we can dissolve back and forth between our overlaid image and the background data. The benefit here is that if there is recorded imagery on our surveillance footage that is not present in our 3D background, we can now measure those objects with ease. For example, here's an image of a vehicle driving from left to right across the image. And if we want to measure the position of this vehicle, we can bring our mouse to the area of the tire, project through the image, and mark a position in 3D. Now we can play forward in the image to another point in time. And then we can do the same process here of projecting through the image, marking that position of the tire. And now we have a distance that the vehicle has traveled between the position one and position two, which in this case is about 9.38 feet. Now that was a bit of an oversimplification of the process at hand, but it was a hopeful uh, foundation that we can set here before we go through the next examples that will, I hope, um, provide clarity onto how powerful this technique can be. While we get there, there's a few different variables that affect our ability of measuring the distance. We have issues related to the accuracy of the scanner itself. So in other words, if we're scanning with a, a 3D laser scanner, that device is inherently going to have some error within it. We then have errors related to the resolution of the image. We'll talk in a bit in more detail about what resolution means. But for now, think about resolution as being the ability of identifying a location of an object within an image. That relates to the density of the pixels. A pixel being, of course, a square-shaped color value inside of our image. And within that, there is no additional detail. So in other words, the pixels are the smallest indivisible entity within an image. Uh, we can't get anything else within a pixel other than a square color value. This is going to limit our ability of measuring where a location is, because of course we cannot measure within a single pixel. A pixel is the smallest measurable item within the image. We also have issues related to compression that will affect our ability of identifying resolution. Oftentimes individuals will commonly understand resolution to be the number of pixels in the image. But really quickly here, to think about the, an, another aspect of resolution that is important, if we were to take an image and let's say that the image is 1920 by 1080 pixels. So an HD, relatively large image. If we were to take that image and compress the image, and then continue to compress it further and further and further using something like JPEG compression over and over and over again, our final image will still have the same number of pixels. It will still be 1920 by 1080 pixels, but of course we've still reduced the resolution. So although resolution is related to pixel density, there's another factor here that can affect our ability of measuring uh, the location of an object within an image. 
Then, of course, there's the primary error in this particular process is the ability of overlaying the image and the inherent uh, accuracy that comes into play when taking the image and placing it over top of the 3D. So these three different variables will affect our ability of measuring the data through reverse projection, and they're important to understand so that we can accurately calculate our margin of error in any reverse projection process. And I'm going to go through a specific couple of case examples that highlight how that process is done. And I'm going to start here by showing a final case when everything is put together, what this can look like when all is said and done. Here we have a very short sequence of images um, that relate to a civil case that is uh, currently closed using this, this technique of reverse projection. What you'll see momentarily is a bus driving from left to right down the roadway. Take a left-hand turn into this direction uh, in the image, and simultaneous to that, a motorcycle is driving down from right to left and runs into the, the side of the vehicle. So here we'll play forward in real time, and there's an impact. And the questions at hand in the civil portion of this case were primarily the speed of the vehicles in question, the perspectives that were available to the bus driver, the perspectives that were available to the motorcycle, and potentially any witnesses that were also on scene. So there's a number of questions here that are ultimately going to relate to the, our ability of calculating distance and our ability of calculating time. This webinar is specifically going to focus on the calculation of distance. Previous webinars that we've run, and we have a scheduled webinar that's going to be run again in a few months uh, that related to the ability of calculating time on a digital recording device. One quick comment that's important to note here before we move further is that timing on these surveillance systems is more frequently variable than it is static. In other words, when a DVR system, digital video recording system, one that captures video evidence like this, when it reports that it is capturing at seven frames per second, as an example, that does not mean that every single image is one seventh of a second apart. There is variability within that recording device, which means that the amount of time that passes between image one and image two is usually different than the amount of time that passes between image two and three and so forth. And there are some tools within Input Ace that allow us to calculate that with additional specificity. But that goes beyond the scope of this particular webinar. Looking back to the video sequence that we had here in question, what we are going to do in the next um, couple examples is perform the final reverse projection process. Take that same set of images, overlay it on top of our 3D point cloud, and the benefit here now is that we, in the background, have two separate objects. We have a 3D point cloud of the scene in question that was captured through a number of different scans of the area. And we have a 3D point cloud of a object of the bus. Now, this is the same make, model, and year as the bus that was involved in the incident. And so now we have two different objects in whichever 3D point cloud tool uh, that we're preferring to use. The reason that we're doing it this way is that we can bring in our overlay of our image set. We can dissolve back and forth between that overlay and the background, and we can physically move the object of the bus into position so that it lines up with the image that we have on screen. Now that we can do this, we can measure the position of the bus at any point in time within a margin of error, and we can continue to do that process for any frames that may be relevant. Now that we have that bus's position, we can, of course, fly off the axis of the camera into any other third dimension that we might need to present. But an added significant benefit here is that what we're about to show is not a animation where we are animating through a, a sequence of images and, and interpolating the values between them. But instead, we have a measured position for every single location of the bus in question. This is a forensic science that allows us to measure plus or minus a given known margin of error. When put together, we can now take the camera and its position that it has in two-dimensional space. We can dissolve into the position at any point in time that we might want, where we've replicated the position of the bus and the motorcycle. We can now fly off the axis and then play forward through these sequence of images in question. And that process is not an animation in the sense of interpolating data between this, but is simply reverse projection measurements that are being shown at every single point in time that was recorded by the camera device. 
This takes us out of the realm of artistic rendition and brings us into the realm of forensic science with measurable positions. Every single one of them, of course, being known between a margin of error. So how do we calculate the margin of error on a case like this? Well, margin of error, as we talked about, includes those three variables, the scanner's accuracy, the resolution of the camera itself, and then the calibration accuracy. And the scanner accuracy, we can use the manufacturer of the devices um, reference for what the scanner accuracy is. Um, we recommend going a little step further than that and providing on-scene measurements that we can use to relate back to our 3D scanner. So for example here, we have in 3D space on a new case here, we've got a series of objects that are being measured. Uh, we have the width of the, uh, the parking slot here, we have the height of a camera, and we have the width of a building. Um, we also have a known measurement in 3D space from the edge of a mailbox all the way to the camera, and that measurement is about 105.39 feet. So we can take a bunch of measurements in 3D space, and then we take those same exact measurements on scene when we are performing the initial measurements while we're there. So here we have, as an example, a series of measurements, and excuse me, my um, Adobe is freezing up on me, so let me get to this point here where I can rotate this. We take those exact same measurements that we are on scene in reality with either a tape measure or some other secondary device, and then we can relate each of these measurements back to our scanner's measurements. And in this particular case, our scanner's measurements that are different from the on-scene measurements is primarily the measurement of the height of the camera, where the on-scene measurement was taken at 10.1 feet, and the 3D measurement was taken at 10.06 feet. Now, realistically, this is primarily due to human error and not necessarily error inherent in the device, but it helps to provide a more broad understanding of what the potential error is in the case. And so if we take this understanding that for every 10.1 feet, we're going to be about 0 0.0 feet off in our measurement. In other words, there's that much error for every 10.06 feet. So if we reduce that down to the number of, of feet specifically, we're dealing with an error of 0 0.0038 feet times every foot that is the distance from the camera device. We're going to use that in our final margin of error to calculate what the total margin of error can be from this particular variable. The next piece that is important is to look at the resolution. Now the resolution, again, as we had talked about, was the pixels per inch in the target area. So the way that we measure this is we look at a image and we look at an area of relevance. In this particular case, and I'll show the video in this case momentarily, the area of relevance is the area in this area of the image. And there are two known objects here that are 108 pixels apart. Before I go too much further, let me take a quick step back here and let's take a look at the video in question and let's take a, a, a quick understanding of what it is that we're trying to accomplish here. In this particular video, what we're going to see momentarily is a garbage truck that is going to drive down a roadway in this region of the video. The garbage truck will begin to make a left-hand turn right about the center of the screen. And then moments later, a semi-truck comes driving down the same relative area. Here's the garbage truck in question about to make a left-hand turn. A semi-truck comes driving in the same direction and then runs into the backside of the garbage truck right about there. The questions in this particular case because this is a, a civil matter where the, the driver's uh, leg was taken off and it had a young child that was actually thrown out from the, the back bed of the, the semi-truck into the roadway. Uh, it was a pretty um, graphic case. And what we're trying to answer in this particular case is not so much the, the, the timing of the events, but the lanes that each of the vehicles are in. Because we're dealing with a very low resolution at a very hard angle, it's challenging to understand where the vehicle is within its lane. So we have a garbage truck here driving down the roadway, taking its left-hand turn, and then of course we have our semi-truck about to follow shortly thereafter. And the primary question at hand is where that semi-truck is in the roadway. There was an uh, opposing expert on the matter that had defined uh, where that vehicle was, and we were coming in from a, a bit of a blind perspective to redo the calculation and to show uh, where that vehicle is. 
So going back to a resolution, we're looking at this area is the area of relevance. So there's going to be a different resolution in this area of our image than there might be over in this area. Because of course the number of pixels per inch in this area of the image is, is a much higher resolution than the same data over in this area that's further away from the camera. Knowing that this is about 108 pixels apart, we're going to relate that to what that object is in reality. Now what that object, those two objects are, are two different signs that are street signs that are in the background of this image. By projecting from the camera out to the two signs, we can see that they're behind the roadway. So the roadway is here and the two signs are further back in our image. And what we want to do is find out how far the distance is between those areas in the area of the roadway. So not necessarily in the area that's far back in the image, but what is the distance in the area of interest, which is in the area of the roadway. So to do that, we've projected a cone from the camera out to the two signs in question. We can then look at an overhead perspective of what the distance is in the area of the roadway. And it's about 43.77 feet. So in other words, we're looking at a resolution of 108 pixels that takes up a distance of 43.77 feet. So the resolution error in this particular case can be deduced down to 43.77 feet per 108 pixels, which means 0.41 feet per pixel. We can never be more accurate than 0.41 feet per pixel as it relates to the resolution. Then we have our overlay issues, which are related to the accuracy of our calibration, the ability of calibrating this data on top of the 3D background. And I'm going to skip over the calculation of this for now so that we can show how it's done within Input Ace. I think that will be much more simple to provide a thorough visual um, than it would be to, to show this in question. So really quickly here, to sum up our margin of error, we have a total potential error that includes three different variables, the scanner error, the resolution error, and the calibration error. And what we're going to ultimately do is take the sum of each of those individual variables, and that sum will be our final, our final margin of error. So we look at our potential scanner error times the distance from camera, we look at our potential resolution error, and we look at our calibration error, which is in terms of pixels. So to get the calibration error, we're multiplying the number of pixels that our calibration is uh, different from the background times the potential resolution error to get those three final variables that ultimately sum up to be 1.36 feet. Now I know if this is your first time being exposed to reverse projection processes, this may be um, a, a lot to look at on one slide. We're going to follow this exact same process inside of Input Ace to show just how easy it is and how this calculation is done automatically to get your final margin of error. So how is that used in this particular case? Well, we're looking at an error of plus or minus 1.36 feet to measure data through reverse projection in our area of interest. And we're going to put that all together now into a final demonstrative that we can provide to the trier of fact to establish significant additional information. So here we have our 3D point cloud flying into the perspective of the camera. We're going to dissolve into our overlaid image that has been calibrated and overlaid on top of our 3D background. This particular image is the image in question of our semi-truck driving from left to right in the image. And we can see a series of illuminated lights on that vehicle. We're now going to project through to the front light and to the rear light of the vehicle in question to create a cone that is shaped between the back end of the vehicle and the front end of the vehicle. There are two red dots here now, if I go back and forth between that area, that we'll see are actually lines. Now right now they appear as dots because they're coming directly into the center of the camera lens in question. But if I come back and replay this sequence again here, so we've got our three-dimensional model into the camera's perspective, dissolving now into the overlaid image again with the vehicle in position. We can see the rear light and the front light. And when we dissolve into that area here, we're going to see those red dots projecting through the image so that when we come up overhead of that, we can see the cone that is shaped over the area of the roadway. Now, of course, that is the measured location for those two lights. We have to keep in mind that there's a margin of error here. Before applying the margin of error, let's see where our vehicle would be if it was striking 
at the exact back end and the exact front end of those lights in question. So here we have another model of an object that is the same make, model, and year of vehicle as the known vehicle in question at the same size. And we can see here that our light is being um, it, uh, intersected here on the front and the rear end of the vehicle. So it's measured to be directly in the center lane. But let's apply our margin of error now to see all of the areas that that vehicle can be in. To do that, we have to take our margin of error, which of course is that 1.36 feet, and we're going to add two parallel lines that are 1.36 feet parallel to the, the measured line. So now we have a furthest to the right possible line that can exist and a furthest to the left possible line that can exist for each of those measurements. Now that this is in place, we can take our vehicle in question and we can push it into all of the appropriate areas that it possibly can exist. So here we've pushed it all the way forward, as far forward as it can be in the middle lane before any further than this would take it outside of the area of the margin of error. Then we can do that same process by pushing it as far up as we can before it gets out of the area of the margin of error. Any further up that we would be, we would lose the, uh, the area of this cone. It would start to get pushed out from the rear end of the vehicle. We can now do the same process by pushing it as close to the camera as we can. Any further than this, we'll again leave that area of the cone. Now once we've done that, we can show all of the different positions that that vehicle can be in, as far back as it can go, as far forward as it can go, as far up and as far down as it can go, to create a, an outline of all of the area that that vehicle could exist in. We're now going to dissolve away all of the, the objects in question and leave the overlaid region to show that within our margin of error, that area is where the vehicle is in this case. This was extremely helpful for the trier of fact. Um, the reason being that the left-hand turn lane where the vehicle that was turning left existed in, by taking its left-hand turn, the rear end of that vehicle had kicked out into the middle lane when it was taking its left-hand turn. And the vehicle that struck it going down in this path, it was important to understand if it was trying to transition lanes or if it was fully in this lane uh, during that point in time. And we can see here that at the moment that it's visible on the camera, it's already within this cone measured to be in the center lane, but at the far ends of the extreme of the margin of error, it could be as far as this or as close to the camera as this. So that's a quick case example of how we use reverse projection to establish what would be a very challenging question to answer to begin with. If we go back to our original video in question, when looking at the position of the vehicle, we can't even see the roadway to begin with. And so by bringing in that third dimension, by bringing in that calibration process, We've taken an impossible question to answer and made it a possible question to answer that was of significant value to the trier effect. So let's put all those pieces together now and show how that's actually done. I'm going to go into a full thorough walkthrough now uh, using the video that we had started with in question. So casting our minds back to this case where we have our vehicle taking a left-hand turn and the, uh, the impact that occurs here, we're going to bring that data into input ACE and take a look at a brand new tool that exists within the program. That tool can be accessed on the tools page. And again, I should mention that this is a tool that is not yet released in the program. This is currently in our, in our beta process. So beta users of the tool now have access to this. Um, but this is a brand new tool for us. Uh, it's also a very exciting tool for us as it's our first patent pending uh, tool in the program. Uh, it's a very, very exciting thing for our, for our company as we, we continue to to, to push forward and, and integrate tools that are going to be of use to individuals in the crash recon world or in the use of force world. Inside of the camera match overlay tool, we are presented with a very, again, simple interface. We like to keep things as easy as possible and as intuitive as possible within input ACE. And so for every step of the way, which you'll notice there are five different steps in the application to create a final result, we have a button for how to use this step that provides plain English understanding of what to do. In this case, we have to load our background image and our original video. So I'm gonna do that here now. I'm going to take my video sequence in question and I'm going to take my 3D screenshot and I'm going to add those to the program. So how is this done? Well, here I have a screenshot from a 3D program. Now a significant benefit of using Input Ace's camera match overlay tool is that we can work with any third-party point cloud tool. So I'm seeing one of the questions come in that's asking what point cloud 
um, models we can integrate into input A. So what do we import? And the answer is that we don't import any. We don't need to. We let you use any third-party tool that you already have access to for the 3D portion of this application. So here, for example, we have uh, a 3D program that was used on this case uh, a number of years ago. It's, and you can see here that we have a, a typical 3D model for the area of inc the incident. We have this area where the vehicle is taking its left-hand turn, the bus in question. We have this roadway where the motorcycle is coming down through the intersection before running into the, um, the impact area at the center of the intersection. The camera in question is a camera that is down right here in this area of the, of the 3D point cloud. So what we're going to do is create a perspective at that area of the camera. And I've already done that here by simply recreating a position in the point cloud. So here's a perspective from the camera lens. And we can simply take a screenshot of this now to take that screenshot into input ACE. So again, that process can be done with any third-party point cloud tool. We'll then use that on our camera match overlay by taking that screenshot and dragging it in as our background image. That's going to load that into our background. Then we're going to take our video sequence in question and drag that into our right-hand side for the image. We then go through a number of steps, and I'm not going to perform each of these steps to save some time. I'm going to load a final example where this is done. So I'm going to quickly go through the steps to show what they are without performing them, and then I'll load uh, an example that's already been completed. This takes about five minutes of, of, of registration points that I'm going to skip over. So here, if I go to my next image, we take this full screen. This is where we correct the lens distortion, where, of course, we want to identify objects that are curved that shouldn't be curved. Then we go to the next step where we match points. This is where we are now creating correspondence points or registration points to register, for example, that area of the point cloud to that area of the image. And that process is done for a number of different points to quickly register the data and create as many points as possible, ideally around the area of interest in, in particular, um, some, we need as few as four points, but it's recommended to go through to as many as, as 15 or so points. After this step is done, and I'm going to just very quickly here go through and create four points. It requires that before I can go to my next step. So here's a third point. And then here's a fourth point. I'll make sure that's the correct area. Fourth point. It doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not actually going to be using this. Once we go into our next step, we get to the area that's really of interest. So I'm going to take this and now actually go to a real one so we can look at one that's actually fully been done. Let me load a camera match file where we put a little more time into actually fully calibrating the data. And while that loads here, we'll get an area that shows us our transition in question. Let me go back through the steps so we can see this in detail. So we get to our match points. This is the series of points that were picked on this particular image. You can see there's a lot more that were done in this case, probably a little bit overboard. Um, I'd recommend usually staying in the area of about uh, you know, 20 plus or minus a few points. And once I go into my next step, what we'll see here is the transition where this image slides on top of the other image in a bit of an animation to allow us to then see this data and visualize the overlay back and forth. And of course, my screenshot here includes the, the bus in, in question. Once this is done, we go through a series of steps to calculate the margin of error by popping open our margin of error and entering in the data for each of these steps. So what is the error of my scanning device, as we mentioned earlier? Then we go through to the next step where we calculate the potential error from the calibration. This is done by repicking correspondence points, uh, which is done in a slightly different way to calculate the difference in the, the, the area that the pixels are from this portion of the, the calibration in the margin of error step relative to the other calibration that was done earlier in the app. Then the last step is to measure known distances between objects. So in this case, those three areas were identified. And once that data is saved out of the program, it automatically creates a PDF file that looks like this. The PDF comes out of the program we can view it in full screen here for what each of those lines represents. So our first item here, this line, includes a potential error in the area of interest of 0.01 feet times the distance this is from the camera 
plus a static 0.96 feet. So that's how we calculate our margin of error. All of the data that we went through earlier in the slide was the manual approach to calculating this. Here we see how Input Ace does this automatically to create the area of interest and the different resolutions and the margins of error that we're going to have in those areas. Okay, once that's all been said and done, let's take a look at the actual real value of this. And this is one of the um, primary areas that our, our, our patent uh, is, is concerned with, is the, the, the math that's used to do the calibration, of course. And then this very um, unique technique here of launching this data into an overlay. So what I've just done here is launched an overlaid window. Now you can see that this is moving around all over my screen. And I've got my 3D point cloud tool, whichever tool is your preferred 3D point cloud tool, and my image now that is popped out as an overlay on top of this. I've already set the location where this is supposed to go, but at the very first time you use this, you'd want to drag this back into place and to nudge it into position. In this case, it was uh, 262 by 90 pixels. So what's happened here is I've nudged this image back into place so that when I dissolve back and forth between my image and the background, you can see here that the area of interest now between my overlay and the background can be dissolved back and forth fluidly. We also have the ability now of going frame by frame by frame forward here as we can go forward through our image to see the area where the vehicle comes into perspective. And if I go forward here through the sequence, I can stop on any one of these images and then begin to measure that data through my image again in any point cloud tool that we might want. So I'm gonna go forward here to a position prior to the impact point, right about here. And what I've already done here, if I set my opacity down to about 50%, is I can lock that image into place. Now what locking the image into place does is allow me to now click through the image and affect my background 3D point cloud. So for example, if I was trying to measure the position of the bus in question, I can bring in my object of the bus, and I can now move that object in the background data to line it up with my image. Again, within that margin of error that we have in question. So any of the mouse clicks that I'm doing right now are happening through the image into my point cloud tool. So here's my point cloud tool in question, and I'm moving my object in the point cloud. And of course, I can fly up to a new axis if I need to. I just undid that to put it back into place. And if I go back down into my camera perspective, I can now dissolve in my overlay to show any portion of the image that I want, either fully opaque or you know, roughly 50%, so that when I select my object and want to move it around, I can measure the position of where that object goes. I can do that with any of the objects in question. So for example, my car and the bike as well, which then allows me to place those objects within that margin of error, fly off the axis. If I go back into you know, completely transparent, I can fly off the axis and combine together any demonstratives that I might need. So in this case, when doing the fly through process, we've got from our 3D point cloud tool, the ability of creating transitions and fly throughs from an overhead perspective to a behind the data perspective to, for example, inside of the camera view. Once we're in the camera view, we have this entire sequence that we can dissolve into and move forward frame by frame. And then we can dissolve back out of this data into our point cloud tool to then fly off the axis into any position that we might want. So going back to the way that this was put together again in our original clip that we showed, we can produce exhibits that look like this. Starting from within the camera, playing forward through the data, dissolving into the image within that measurable area, flying off the axis into a new perspective, and then either playing forward through that data at, any, at the same frame rate to show that perspective from another angle. Okay, so that's a very quick overview of how the tool is used. Um, what I'd like to do now is just show a couple of additional completed cases that this has been done on. Uh, one of the significant values, again, of using the camera match overlay tool is that the reverse projection process um, is something that has uh, been used in courts for quite some time. Um, we have a number of um, cases where this has been, been used in both civil and criminal litigation, uh, including undergoing Daubert and Fry. Um, so this is a, a, a well-established well um, methodology and practice. The aspects within InputAce um, allow this to be done in a, 
uh, expedited way and some very unique uh, additional tools like the, the projection through the image. Um, and what I'm going to do now here is just walk through a couple of additional case examples. This is another tool that is used within the InfoDace program to output PDFs that include attached images and video. Uh, if you haven't seen the way that InfoDace does this, I, I recommend taking a look at, again, other online images. Um, but the question at hand in this particular case, I'm going to walk through a, a series of images here um, through an attachment. We have an overhead um, drone image that is capturing surveillance of an area right before an incident occurs. Um, the home, the house that is right here at the upper right hand side of the image uh, was under surveillance for selling drugs and guns out of the house and the local police department set up containment around the area of interest. This is a, uh, FLIR, a FLIR system that has a um, heat sensitive recording. So a lot of what we're seeing here is uh, related to uh, infrared uh, heat. And what we're going to notice here is that as we go frame by frame forward, what ends up happening in the area of interest is that this is the house in question. The police set up containment, including having officers that were behind this building right here. And the neighbor of this location comes outside of his house and begins to open fire and shoot at the police. We'll see a series of muzzle flashes as I go frame by frame forward through here. So there's this, the first muzzle flash in question. And then as we go through uh, forward through this, if we resize this up, this is what the muzzle flash looks like in its enlarged size um, as the DVR recorded it. And as we go frame by frame forward through this, we'll end up seeing a number of additional muzzle flashes. Flash, flash. And the primary question at hand in this particular case is who fired shots first? Was it the police? Was it the individual coming out of his house? Um, the police's statement was that he, um, the individual coming um, uh, in his area of the porch, was firing first. But there was some confusion that was added to the case because one of the one of the experts involved had looked at the muzzle flashes and had tried to define the directionality of the flash based on the shape of the image in question. So what we're going to show here is the location where those muzzle flashes come from using this technique of reverse projection. Here's the final demonstrative in question. Again, we have a 3D point cloud. Um, this is a perspective of a, a point that is about 5,000 feet back with a zoomed in focal lens. And what we're now going to do is dissolve in our image of the very first time the muzzle flash occurs. So here we can see where that muzzle flash is. And just like the last case, we're going to project through our image down to the area of interest. We've got a straight line coming from the camera lens now. And if we get rid of our focal lens, we can see what it looks like at about the 5,000 feet back. And we can now zoom into that area of interest and know that within our margin of error, the muzzle flash exists around the area of that line. And we can see when we come down into the region that this is the home that's owned by the individual who, who is firing the shots. And the muzzle flash is coming in this area, which is right at the area where the police exist. So the question, of course, is, well, if the muzzle flash is occurring along this area of the line, if the individual is firing his shots, where would the muzzle flashes be visible? And can we identify, quote unquote, who shot first? Well, one of the inherent problems with this is that there are perspectives that are not visible from the, from the perspective of that camera. For example, we've created planes, two-dimensional planes in this image to show the areas that are not visible by the drone system. This home right here has an area that is invisible to the drone back in this region. So any activity that's happening back here is not visible because the drone is only seeing the data that is in this region right here. So everything to the right of this plane is not visible by the drone. Anything to the left of this plane is not visible by the drone. And just to show how we can know that, if we fly back to the perspective of the drone in question, we can see that the rooftop intersects this area and hides all the data behind here. So I mean, the data here, if I pause right now, everything that's to the left of this area of the roof won't be visible, and everything to the right of that edge of the building won't be visible. So if we go back to the perspective of the drone, Again, that 5,000 feet back, bring back in our focal zoom. We can see what is and what isn't visible, knowing that only that area is visible. 
and that's the area of the muzzle flash. So of course the question is then, if that's the area of the police in this particular case, would we even see any muzzle flashes from the individual who is inside the building or on side of his porch? And the answer of course is no. That data wouldn't be visible by the camera. So at this point in time, it, it takes the, the argument down to the witnesses on scene and what was identified on scene. Because of course we can't identify who fired first because we can't see the area that the individual is in. Okay, quick example of how that is, is useful. Um, I know that I'm running about uh, five minutes or so left in time, so I'm going to walk through one additional case example, and then I'm going to open this up to some questions. This is another case example involving a, a motor vehicle incident where a driver struck and killed a five-year-old child who was crossing the road um, in an area um, that was right outside of the view of a camera lens. One of our primary um, instructors uh, uh, before Input Ace, the um, director of uh, law enforcement training, uh, was teaching a course at the FBI National Academy. And one of the attendees came back um, a couple weeks after the training at the, at the FBI and it had this case and was hoping, of course, that in, we were be, would be able to enhance the area of the license plate. And like most video in question, when we look at the vehicle, which is right here in question, the area of the license plate includes very little, if any, detail. In this particular case, there's no way to enhance that data to get a license plate. Now, there are, of course, enhancement tools within Input Ace, some of which can provide dramatic results. But in a case like this, where we're dealing with a pile of white pixels and nothing else, where it's all oversaturated, there's no other detail in here other than white and nothing can be done to enhance the license plate. However, witnesses on scene identified the vehicle as being a late 90s red Pontiac Grand Am. So based on the witness statements, there is a known range of vehicles that could exist. And using the video, there's another area of interest that is unique for this vehicle compared to other vehicles of the same class. And that is the headlight spread pattern, or the way that the headlights reflect on the ground. And we can see here in this perspective that there are three prongs of light that strike the ground within a shape. And the reason that this is helpful to see that with the vehicle on this camera view is that we can track the vehicle from other perspectives where it's visible uh, showing that same three-pronged pattern. Um, let me go to another camera perspective here. Um, this is another perspective where the vehicle is driving from left to right, and we can again see that same three-pronged pattern, where the vehicle is coming around the corner here, and we can see in detail those three distinctive areas of interest. So the vehicle starts on this camera view, takes a left-hand turn onto a main street, moments later strikes the child directly out of view of this camera view here, and it's, the vehicle is now captured driving in this direction up the roadway. It then takes a right-hand turn up around the street corner on another view. And this is the right-hand turn that we're seeing now coming in this perspective around here. So we've got continuity of the vehicle through those three different areas. We know that it is a red Pontiac Grand Am, and we know that it has that three-pronged beam pattern. What was then provided to the investigators in the case was a quick PDF chart, which is visible here, showing that three-pronged headlight pattern. The suggestion was made to the investigators in this case to pull an offline search of every single Pontiac Grand Am that was a late 90s model in the entire county. And a small number of a few dozen vehicles were registered in that county. Based on that, the investigators went door to door to door, knocking on every single civilian's door that had one of these vehicles. They were then asked to turn their headlights on, and the investigators were observing to see if that three-pronged pattern was visible. After going through all of the different residences, one of them that was, was visited had a tarp over their vehicle, and when the headlights came on, it matched this three-pronged pattern. So, of course, this is a very helpful comparison to make between the known vehicle and the vehicle in question. And from that primary evidence, a bunch of other physical evidence was then uncovered as well, things like cell phone records um, and other evidence as well. But it all started from this video and the headlight spread pattern to filter down to that particular suspect.
And so to take this out of the realm of simple comparison and into the realm of a visual reverse projection process, the vehicle was scanned. So this is the known vehicle that was owned by the suspect in the case. We can see here in the scan photographs that are embedded into the point cloud that clearly show that three-pronged pattern. In addition, two test vehicles were scanned that were simply vehicles of the same make, model, and year that were owned by other civilians in the area. We can then measure the location where that three-pronged pattern exists and doesn't exist in the test vehicles. And then the real benefit now is that we can place that back into position with the headlights back into view to then dissolve between our questioned vehicle, which is the vehicle that captured by the surveillance system, and the known vehicle in the position here in the point cloud. We can do the same thing for the two test vehicles to ultimately put together a demonstrative that appears like this. Here's the area of interest. We're flying down into the perspective of the camera right now. This camera view captures that first video of the vehicle driving up the roadway before taking the right-hand turn. And if we dissolve into the overlaid video perspective now and play through the video, what we're going to do quickly is an enhancement process done within Input Ace to enhance that video data to actually see where the child's position is on the ground. So by clearing up the data, clarifying that video data, we can actually identify the location of where that child is on the ground here. What we can also do is see the vehicle as it begins to make its right-hand turn. So going into the next video perspective, and I should mention that the videos in question here and the reporting style, this is something done automatically with Input Ace to automatically embed video and images into a report. So here we have the vehicle making a right-hand turn, and we've placed the vehicle, the known vehicle, the scanned object of the vehicle with the headlights into that position, and we can now fly into the new camera perspective. This is the new camera perspective where the vehicle is making the right-hand turn. And I'll pause here momentarily. We have the known vehicle placed via that reverse projection process. We're now going to dissolve into the video and show that the headlight spread pattern of that questioned vehicle is matching the known vehicle. There's, there's no observable, um, th there's no undefinable differences uh, between those two objects, but there is between the test objects themselves. So between our known object and test vehicle two, there's the obvious explained difference of the headlights being diff different. But between our questioned vehicle and our known vehicle, there are no unexplained differences between the way that those headlights appear. In other words, it's a match. And if we fly up and overhead to an overhead perspective, we can see the difference between our known vehicle and the two test vehicles in question. We dissolve in the headlights of test vehicle one, and then even the difference between test vehicle one and test vehicle two. And once we go back to the known vehicle, take a look at the illumination along the left-hand side in, of this area. Once we dissolve back into our image, keep an eye in that area here. And once the video begins to play forward, we'll see that area move. So each of those different areas of the headlights in question are matching up with the, the question vehicle and help to provide a comparison between the vehicle in question and the known vehicle of the suspect in conjunction, of course, with all of the other evidence that was gathered by investigators. Okay, I'm nearing right about an hour. I hope that this helps to provide an overview of the forensic video process of reverse projection. Um, I helps, hope it helps provide a perspective of how that is done within Input Ace, how to simply calculate the margin of error through a number of button pushes within Input Ace and what's actually happening under the hood when that's being calculated, and how easy it is to use this patent pending tool within Input Ace um, in conjunction with any third-party point cloud tool you're already using. Um, any tool that allows for the view of 3D can be used with the Input Ace um, camera match overlay tool. So I'm seeing a number of questions um, come in. Um, uh, first off, uh, one of the questions is, what is the cost of Input Ace? Um, I'll d defer that question to, uh, to the account managers and salespeople in your area. But what I can say is that the camera match overlay tool is going to be provided for free to any customers that own Input Ace um, before the tool is released. We're expecting that the tool is going to be, be released in January. And any current customers will be provided with this update for free as part of their, their support package. At that point in time, after it's been released, 
um, we will be um, having a, an additional charge for the tool. So I recommend that if, you, if you're looking at getting access to this early without the additional cost, um, that you uh, talk to your account manager before the end of the year. I've got another question coming in about the calibration error um, and how uh, it can be known to the hundredths of a pixel. And the reason that uh, it's calculated in that manner is that the calibration of the image is going to create new pixels through that process of interpolation. Those new pixels are going to line up in a different way from the background image, which when comparing those two um, allows for the measurement to the hundredth of a pixel, or at least creates the ability of measuring that to, um, to that kind of a scale. Of course, it's multiplied by the resolution accuracy um, to finalize that, uh, that particular measurement. And it's simply a, a way of measuring how different the pixels are in the new image from the background image. Um, I got, have a question about uh, what kind of point cloud tools are we referring to? In other words, are we referring to things like um, Cloud Compare and Scene and uh, any tool by Leica or any tool by Eris or Regal? And the, the question is yes, it's any point cloud tool um, that can view point clouds can be used with this process with Input Ace. Um, this will be a recorded webinar. It will be initial. It will be put up online for subsequent viewing. So some of the questions that I'm seeing are about uh, uh, repeat work about confusion in the process. I recommend that you uh, rewatch the area where we talk about the way that the margin of error is calculated. I hope that that will be helpful to to understand this in more detail. Um, I do see a question in here about how sensitive the initial screen capture is from the 3D software, which is a great question. So what's, the question here, if I understand it correctly, is when we're, when we're recreating the perspective of the camera, so if I go back into input ACE here, if we look at the camera's perspective, of course there's going to be an inherent um, challenge about reproducing exactly the XYZ coordinates for that camera perspective. And that's exactly the problem that input ACE solves with its patent pending approach. We don't need to be exactly specific where that camera's point of origin is. It's helpful to be as precise as possible because it will reduce the error. But if we're off in a range of uh, uh, around the camera, that's going to be addressed by how much error that increases by byproduct of the calibration accuracy. So we inherently include a calculation of the error by an improper um, positioning of the camera's perspective. So in other words, I recommend that uh, the camera is positioned as accurately as possible, but any inaccuracies from that process will just increase the margin of error by, by byproduct of the calibration accuracy. That's a very, very great question. Uh, the question is, if this hasn't been released, um, how has it been used in real cases? Um, one of the, the answers to that is that our office um, has about 100 active court cases right now. Um, through one of our, our sister companies that, uh, that utilizes this. Um, and the process of reverse projection is not a new technique. Reverse projection is something that's been around for a very long time, um, even dating back to before 3D point clouds existed. That data um, has been used in courts and has gone through Daubert, as well as the, the technique of integrating it with 3D evidence um, through the tool that we're showing here. Um, this has been used in a number of court cases and is only now about to be available to the public through an automated process within Input Ace. I have another question here about can we use this 3D uh, technique instead of doing it within 3D? Can we do it within a two-dimensional view? And absolutely, the answer is yes. Um, this technique can be used with historic um, uh, techniques for reverse projection. In other words, for those of you who do that process, um, that's done through um, uh, taking a current perspective from the camera, um, as well as the historic recorded images, and overlaying them while on scene. Um, I won't go into too much more detail on that just to avoid confusion, but the answer is yes. Uh, you can absolutely use this process within 2D as well. Okay, um, I'm seeing a couple of additional questions coming in, but I'm unfortunately um, a little bit over time. Um, please don't hesitate to, to send us additional emails we can be reached again at our website, and I'll leave our website up here just to end um, the, the webinar here, is www.inputace.com. 
We have a active blog with a number of additional articles. Um, please connect with us on LinkedIn to see those articles while they are, they're coming out, even ahead of time. Uh, we have a lot of additional um, customer appreciation and uh, blog posts that go up onto LinkedIn. So I recommend that you, you connect with our team on LinkedIn. Uh, and then if you're interested in talking directly to uh, our team, we can also be reached at info at inputace.com. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your time, and I, I look forward to supporting you as you get access to this tool, uh, and, and hopefully before the end of the year, so you can avoid the additional costs that will come in the new year. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great rest of your week.